Well, it is the last Friday of the month, and as such, we return to the scene of the crime, where we are <laughs> exhuming the remains of the past of one John D. with my good friend Stephen Chris Crimmy of Logo Sophia. What's going on, kids? Oh, good to see you, Robert. Yeah, yeah. a lot going on. Yeah, it's been uh, well. Things are busy, but you know, we've been uh, we're we're here to. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, maybe the esoteric and alchemical uh, foundations of of this country, so um, maybe you know. So hopefully you get that. And, and the the central figure, it seems, in a lot of that is this one, John D. Uh, of, of Elizabethan England fame. So just to quickly recap, uh, there are some people who are probably just going to be getting into this for the first time that they didn't see our part one. Um, maybe you could just quickly, Steve, do a, like a two, three minute summation of D and then why it's important. And then I know Chris wants to jump in and talk about kind of the esoteric angle as he relates to the, to the uh, founding of the United States. So, yeah, so D um, was, uh, was, was, was called a polymath. And he was living in a time when you could, in fact, learn everything that there was to learn. Um, all the sciences, so he was, and he just uh, pretty much took everything as far as he could during that era, and he was um, born in, um, in in the 1500s, I have to, I don't remember the exact date off my hand, uh, Chris could probably find it, but, uh, and he was a mathematical genius, mathematical prodigy, he was into cartology, he was into map making, and and as many people were in that time, he got into alchemy, hermeticism, uh, Kabbalah, and a sort of a Christian version of, of, the, of the Kabbalah. And he was just absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think he scared the bejesus out of a lot of people uh, because he did have this sort of alchemical and, and, a, and a sorcerer's kind of thing about him. He was the, uh, the template for Prospero in Shakespeare's Tempest, which came out um, just around the time he died. Uh, Tempest was 1610, D died in 1608. Born in 1527. 1527. So he actually lived a long life. Um, he was initially a Catholic. He was actually ordained as a priest, but they may have been to spy on the Catholics uh, under Mary who was uh, the predecessor to Queen Elizabeth, um, often called Bloody Mary because of her treatment of the Protestants at the time. And he had a really nasty bishop who was fond of, of, of doing the things they did in those days, you know, drawn and quartering and all that, that lovely stuff. Um, so he, he was, could have been a spy because he, then he was arrested and probably tortured at one point. Um, but, he was just he was just really interested in in learning amass the largest library known uh, of that time some several thousand volumes whereas you know the entire um you know of uh, oxford library would, would be several hundred volumes he had like four thousand books yeah so he was so he was incredibly well learned and what um he ended up uh, and, and a number of things that he did in pertaining to what we're talking about is um, justify for Elizabeth uh, reasons and why that they should become an, a huge England should become a huge power and and uh, encompass North America and he was the one who invented the term British Empire it was in one of his books and he, um, he was just absolutely brilliant and he goes through his whole life and, and then there is this expeditions to uh, to settle the new world that he was involved in and everything falls apart and then he gets involved in scrying and the elizabeth there were a number of people who were doing that and he wasn't able he reached a point where he said to i guess he said to himself you know i've reached all the worldly knowledge and book learning that i can the only way i can get more inspiration is from the divine now how do you connect to the divine well at that time it was scrying and through angels and there would be a particular glass but he himself through many attempts was not really good at it so um he had a number of people who did it for him to various degrees of success um but then as everything falls apart for his you know, establishing a colony in north america 
and, an, and also to find a Northwest Passage. Um, he gives it all up and just focuses pretty much mainly on scrying when this um, interesting fellow named Edward Kelly shows up. And Edward Kelly was 26 years old when he showed up, so he, about, he was about half the age of Dee at the time. And um, they enter into a, a partnership that lasts something along eight years. And we have the, some, not all, but, but many of the diaries that Dee kept of their, of their interactions and their contacts with the angelic realms, which, um, you know, hopefully we can get a few tales in of because they're just mind-blowing. And, um, and then even then, and then he, after that falls apart, um, he ends up with another scar for the last 15 years of his life. But um, at the end of it, uh, he gets told to burn all those books. So all those diaries are gone from, from the last 15 years. So, so that's the, the, the quick version of, of, uh, of John D. And uh, so Edward Kelly was this, was this, um, seer who worked you know who worked with him so there's a there's a uh, uh picture of kelly that i just put up there with that requisite long beard with the zz top thing going on right way, yeah, way yeah. past age 26 and the and, and 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 the beautiful hat um yeah so 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 we've been delving into this i guess because we're trying to you know, there's a bunch of things we've been noticing for a long time, and a lot of it is the inversion of the sacred, or uh, the um, sacred tale right there, tale yeah, of the sacred. Little levity, right? <laughs> and so something happened a little bit after this, but there was an attempt by a number of people, and we can bring Bacon into this and, and other people to establish the United States as an alchemical place an alchemical colony hermetic and just and i guess can i just be really quick um the, the the background to all this coming about was around the the 14 1453s is the fall of constantinople and all these texts uh, are coming out of the greek world that hadn't been known in the West, in the in the Western Europe, you know, especially Plato, and so um, Ficino in in uh, in Florence is is uh, is one of the people who's who's translating them. And then this at one point this text comes out, and it's the uh, it's by Hermes Trismegistus. That was called the, the Corpus Hermeticum, the the, the works of, of Hermes, and it's a series of books that are really the basis of this of this alchemy. And the main tenet of them is this as above, so below. So that there is a connection, there's a macrocosm and a microcosm. In other words, the entire world is also embedded within the human form. Um, everything everything in, in heaven has its representation on earth and everything is connected in that way. So this, this forms the basis of um, of what goes on uh, of these alchemists that are that are that are uh, starting to take this and, and run with it back at the time, and uh, Paracelsus, of course, is the, is a main figure in all that, and he was an alchemist. And in fact, Chris was making uh, a little bit of plant alchemy today oh, in the garden. Yeah, just doing some flower essences, yeah. Yeah. So she was. So tell them what you're doing. Oh, doing flower essences where you take the the fresh flower out of the garden in the morning and you put it in very pure water in the sunshine and it releases its potency into the water. And then you can take that and preserve that water with some alcohol, with brandy. And Was that like the, like the Bach flower remedy or something like exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's a woman up in Virginia, Michelle Small Wright has uh, what she calls Paralandra Gardens. Mm -hmm. And so she does this whole thing with gardening and using the flower essences. So mm -hmm. I was just renewing, instead of paying her $10 a bottle, I was making my own. So there you go. Oh, yeah. It's We're so like simple it. and beautiful to do it. You know, it's a really well, nice. Clotted Jalpany. Well, so, what flowers were you working with today? Today I was working with uh, summer squash and celery. I just had. 
one little celery plant that went to flower in the greenhouse and just this tiny little cluster of flowers, but that's enough. You just right. get in the essence of the plant. Great. And you try to do it early in the morning before uh -huh. they've released everything out into the atmosphere. Right. So they've already been sleeping overnight and everything like we are, you know, kind right. of in concave. Right. And then it releases into the water. And zinnia Very too, simple. right? Yeah, so the other day I did zinnia and tomato and something else. And there's a whole list of things. Very cool. Doing. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, excellent. So, so D and then bacon or ba so it would be D through bacon saw the United States as what? An what? experiment? Are we talking like that, that the United States itself was kind of this alchemical project? Right. It was the New Atlantis. Well, Bacon wrote, of course, the New Atlantis, which was printed after he died. It was found right. on it, it wasn't complete. It was, it was unfinished, right? It was either complete right. or if you listen to Manley Hall, it was they only published part of it. Okay. Um, and he speaks with certainty on things without any footnotes, any or, footnotes or references. So, so it's kind of... So it's hard to know what to make of him sometimes. Right. You know? So he'll just say things like, well, everyone knows that, you know, but, but no one knows. And, and so scholars, anyway, don't think about it. But anyway, so, so uh, there's, there's, and we, I think we, it, D, Bacon will, will be, and the New Atlantis is another show, but they're both kind of, they're both pointing to the same thing. They both have very different, Bacon, for example, rejects Paracelsus, rejects the microcosm and the macrocosm. Um, so he's, he's a little, he's a little different than what D was doing and he reject, he doesn't reject, but he downplays mathematics. Whereas for, for D mathematics was, um, incredibly important because it's involved, you can't do a cobbler without mathematics. And, um, it's also, it seems to me that he was very much Pythagorean, you know, and for Pythagoras, the world is generated by number, but number as quality. Whereas opposed for someone like Galileo, would, who would actually said, well, the world is comprised of number the same way Pythagoras did. But for Galileo, it was number as quantity. And there's a huge difference there. So, so for Pythagoras, you know, every number has, is a spiritual carrier wave, some mm -hmm. form or another. And ratio, right? So ratio and then, come in there. Right. Well, then, and then from there, you work with ratios, and it gets into the music and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so... So it's really, you know, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, and the other two things you have to kind of realize in the background were when the printing press was invented and the, it sort of came online in the 1450s. Um, but that made all these works transferable around Europe, you know, and people were, D would write in Latin often and other peoples in continental Europe were still writing in Latin. And, and of course, so, so, so that you can send books all over the place and, and anyone. Right. They, they had a universal language. Yeah. Right, right. So sort of like, you know, English has kind of become today. And of course, the other big thing was in 1543, Copernicus, um, which Bacon did not agree that with, the, uh, with the, the Copernican revolution also is another thing he didn't agree with. He thought Copernicus was wrong about he, uh, heliocentrism. But you have to, but you have to really conceive that that would be a huge game changer for your worldview. Um, that you know that 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 the Earth is not the center of everything, right? Um, you know, and that's and that leads to a whole other thing because it and it also goes contra our experience. Our experience, of course, is sun comes up over there in the east and wends its way across the sky and goes down over there. We don't experience going around the sun. Right. So you're, so you're abstracted. In order to go into Copernicus, you're abstracted out of your lived experience. That's right. And for somebody like D, he may have acknowledged Copernicus, but um, they're all called empiricists which means that, that it was, you know, they were dependent, the knowledge was dependent on the senses and on, on, on the senses, you know, what they did, what they perceived, what they recorded, and experiments would follow in, in, that, in that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that would also lead back to this working with the angels because the angels were just, was, were an experience for them. And in fact, it was almost like a theater for them to, to um, 
to watch. In fact, literally, when uh, Kelly, a curtain would open literally for Kelly in, his, in the scrying, mm -hmm. in this little glass that they would scry through. Stone. It wasn't very big. And he would, the, the curtains would come up, and when the angels were done with them, the curtain would come down. Mm. You know, so um, yeah, so so we think it's really important um, to to kind of get a grasp on this, and that's why we're kind of like taking our time and hoping to do a few uh, shows on this because it's it's a big topic, and you know, and I'm too lazy to write a book on it, and there are books that are all over the place. But, <laughs> um, at this point, you know, I think it's kind of fun to do it this way. So yeah, yeah. and I think that we've been feeling like everyone that we've all been under assault as Americans, just that, you know, the whole concept of America now has been so sullied. And um, it's kind of worn us down and ground us down, feeling like there's, there's no kind of uplift or higher vision left anymore. Everything is monetary, 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 power, power, power. Right. And, you know, right. it's really been brought down to the lowest possible chakra. And so we're looking and remembering these glimmers of this vision that was put forth for this continent. Mm -hmm. And it did have a sacred origin. And so that has been co-opted and taken over. And everybody knows today it's all completely flipped. Where it's, it's, all, yes. it's all inverted, that's right. Inverted in such a twisted, sick way. Mm -hmm. and, and the tentacles have gone to every level, every strata of society. And everyone is just feeling so overwhelmed. And I would have to go back to this person who we used to work with, Peter Kingsley, who said that what's needed now is that we need to resound the original note of what this culture was built on. And so we're hearing that note being sounded, it's very distant, and, but we're seeing it in D and his work, going that far back, where these people were working on the angelic realms, they were getting messages for their country, for, for Britain, for England, and seeing that it was, beginning not just with the Britain of their day, but going back to Arthurian Britain, where it was a very high ideal. Mm -hmm. And so they were wanting to bring this and then incorporate it into the new world. This is where the new world order language begins as well, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. British Empire. Mm -hmm. But it seems to get, again, twisted. It gets, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's all have one language and let's all speak the same language and let's have the queen be, you know, the head of all the whole world. But their vision was to have it so you could uplift. They were seeing that what they called the sublunary world, which would be the world below the moon, yeah. the earthly realm, mm -hmm. had even at that time been so lost that it needed to have a revivification of sacred qualities. And so they were seeing this work as how to do that reviving. So they were wanting to get, we wanted to go back to the language of what was spoken in pre-Edenic times, so pre-Eden. What was this language, this sacred language that was being spoken, mm -hmm. where the word was made flesh and everything was, was sacralized? So that's how they started to get involved and in wanting to learn this angelic language. And there was a point where when they did make the contact and they were getting this alphabet given to them, that the letters would come on the piece of paper as a yellow shadow. And then For Kelly. Kelly would trace over that yellow shadow of the letter and then the yellow would disappear mm -hmm. and he'd have the letter. And then they built up over time this language of the angels. And that language actually has syntax and grammar. It's, it's a very cohesive language. It's an actual language that's usable. I guess like Latin and Sanskrit. So they built up the language 
And then they were getting these instructions from the angels. Now that they have the language, you can understand us. So here we're going to give you instructions. We want you to build this sacred furniture. So they built this table to very specific instructions. It was a cube, a three by three foot cube. Right. And then they put all these sigils, these letters all around the outside of that. And they would do all their work. And this table, I think of it as a step down transformer. Mm -hmm. It was a table that was to protect them from these incredibly potent and intense energies that were coming through with the angels. So it was a buffering tool for them so they could be protected and not be completely disintegrated by the um, interaction with these high beings. And there were some wild incidents, things that took place where the, um, the angels, um, they didn't like Kelly. And it seems that Kelly was kind of screwing around on the side and not doing just all good work. He was kind of going outside the ballpark and, you know, doing some work with the darker forces. And I guess the angels knew that, but John D didn't know that he was doing that. But what would happen every once in a while was they'd beat him up. They would physically, Literally. physically harm him. They would, beat up, they would beat up Edward Kelly. Edward mm. Kelly. There was one incident where he had the scrying stone mm -hmm. and an angel thrust the sword out from the scrying stone and into his head. And Kelly then started complaining of having like, it felt like there were little creepy crawly things inside his brain. And he ha actually had this physical reaction to what had happened. Mm -hmm. And then there was another incident where he saw three or four of these small creatures who were earth elementals, like what we would call gnomes or in German, kobold. Um, right. And right. they had shovels and they were walking along. Yeah. And they started to attack Kelly. And they were hitting him with the shovels. And Dee was trying to help him. He was sort of trying to protect himself. He picked up a stool to try to hit them with it. And they broke his arm at the wrist. Wow. And then Kelly, um, John D was able to go and get a wand. And in, in the name of Jesus, he got rid of these kobold creatures, these gnome creatures who were attacking Kelly. But poor Kelly used to get the crap beat out of him physically. So there was all this kind of crazy stuff going on. But ultimately, all that did quiet down, and they were able to get messages come through and get instructions and proceed from there. And you know, but Kelly, but Kelly was the guy who was the master scryer, and he could actually, he was actually the, like the the main summoner, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yes. And mm -hmm. and the and the reporter, and and uh, D was basically the interpreter. I see. He would write everything down that, that mm -hmm. Kelly would be describing. D, you know, it's kind of you know, it's kind of unclear how much D saw, but for the most part, I don't think he really saw with visually anything. No. But he felt things going on. Mm. So yeah, and and you know, and Kelly had you know had had had, had been a um, counterfeiter and had his ears clipped from that. Um, clipped by clipped, we really mean like cut off clipped. Yeah. So, um, so he always had a hat down over, over himself, um, you know, and then they eventually take it on the road really and go to Poland and, and eventually to Prague. Right. Where, um, was it Rudolf the second, I guess was the, uh, yeah, he had Kelly arrested right in 1591. Well, yeah, because the thing was the ain't, well, and there's this whole long thing with the angels because, you know, here's, here's, D was always impoverished. Um, and as a part, of, I think as part of his um, dissatisfaction with the queen and the court and all that, uh, that no one would ever pay, pay him for everything. I mean, he gives them the plans for British Empire and um, Cecil gives him like a side of venison, you know, for his trouble. Um, yeah, it was really insulting. So I think that's part of the reason. So he, he felt like he would get more, uh, you know, he would get more traction in Europe. 
which he did. Um, but as they were going along, they went to Poland, and there was this whole incident with this Prince uh, Lasky. And the things with the with these angels, so this, this also cross-references back what we were talking about with the establishment of empire, um, is that these angels were always not only talking about the, uh, the apocalypse and the second coming that was imminent. Yeah. Um, but they were also making, they were seemed like they were trying to manipulate political events in Europe through Dee and Kelly. Right. And so they would encounter right. this prince and they say, well, maybe we can use this guy, you know, to, uh, to, to, to further our aims. Right. Well, they also thought that if, if he went back to England, that England would then have his services, right? So it would be better to either use him or imprison him so he doesn't get back to England. Right, because they all, because he claimed to have the secret of making gold and they always wanted it. So what do they, you know, what do the, 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 the potentates want? They want, you know, they want him yeah. for the gold. They're not they, looking when for he couldn't do it, they lock him back up again, right? Right, well, he got locked up a couple of times and then there are stories that are not, um, you know, of him trying to escape and breaking his leg and then getting locked up again. And it's, you know, it's unclear, you know, that, that probably led to his, 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 you know, early death. Um, but yeah, he didn't come back. Dee went back to England. Um, and of course he was broke and they broke into his house and sold his library and his alchemical equipment. Well, um, I think it was think his brother-in-law. He, he, yeah, he needed money so desperately and the brother-in-law loaned him money. So he was indebted to him. So while Dee was in, in, in um, Poland and, mm -hmm. and Prague, they ransacked his house and completely like stole his library, stole the books, which were later recollected and reinstated them, to yeah. him. Yeah. But um, they just completely trashed his home while he was away. Yeah, and you know, and you know, but you, you figured there weren't too many people who could be able to use his books anyway. Well, you know, I'm you not so be, sure. I think there was the, he had yeah. so many visitors to the library, right? It was like it was even a lending library. Mm -hmm. He was very generous and let people come in at least and use the books mm -hmm. in his home. So, a curious thing about the angels too is that they um, apparently had read Dee's library. So they, were, especially in the beginning, they would make references to books or symbols that were in his books from other uh, previous um, alchemist types like uh, Agrippa, people like that. And so, you know, so, so you're trying to get at, you know, for, for, for Dee, the angels were real. They were actual. There were times that demons came through that were supposedly there to test them. Um, there were times that the angels came through. There were times that they had to figure out um, the difference between them. I have to tell you, the angels don't come across very well. I, I well, I mean, this, th I had some people reach out to me after our last time together. Uh -huh. And they asked me if I thought that uh, John Dee and Edward Kelly were sorcerers, which is whether the angels were satanic. Um, and you know, and I, and I thought that, well, this is an interesting question. It's very uh, relevant. Well, I mean, from what I know about, the, you know, these processes, not that I've ever partaken in them, but it's not that hard to get, you know, to summon kind of one of these lower level kinds of beings. Absolutely. It's not I was that really hard. surprised because I did, I did not expect that. I thought, oh, angels, you know, angels, angels, mm -hmm. angels are good. Demons are bad. Right. But it seems like they really messed with their heads a lot and they tested them a lot. And they, there was some kind of a statement that, you know, well, these, these forces are here, these darker forces to test you. And if you pass the test, then, you know, you get we'll give elevated. You, we'll, we'll give you more information. We'll give you more, yeah. Yeah. We'll give you more. But I, I ended up getting a, a not very good feeling about the angels themselves. <laughs> so the angels don't come off. So, like no, these. I mean, I've, it, yeah, that's that's the, kind of what I've heard. That they're yeah. you know, they're not very they're not very nice. They don't they don't have that angelic so. sheen. You know, they're. I think that people have been handed a hallmark, saccharine kind of treacle vision of what angels are. They are powers. Yeah, that they're not, are they're, so they're not human. I mean, clearly they're not they're human. Not human. 
No. Yeah. And that's why they needed this step down transformer, the, the sacred furniture, so that they didn't get totally fried when they were working with these forces. So they had the sacred table, which was a protection against that. And as I got further into learning about it, I realized, well, part of the problem was um, Edward Kelly really was kind of like going out the back door and, and you know, paying over his money to, to do some with the dark forces. Right. And that's why the angels were always trying to whip them back into shape. That's the impression I got. So it sounds like Edward Kelly was making deals on the side, right? It really does. Up to a certain point. Yeah, yeah then, then I think he finally learned his lesson. That, yeah. Then he kind of capitulated. And, of course, the, um, the summation of it was, was at, the, at the very end, there was the, uh, the angel that, that told them that they had to swap wives and sleep with each other's wife. <laughs> Which made absolutely no sense to me. No sense to them either. You Isn't know? that what happened to Mike Kekich and Fritz Peterson? Yeah, Mike Kekich and Fritz Peter. Yeah, and and I, and I can't remember. I think it was Kekich and Peterson's wife that ended up getting getting married and staying together. Yeah, it always happens when that old wife swap thing happens. Yeah, right? yeah I wouldn't. I wouldn't. There's like one know, couple. Yeah. By the way, people who don't know what I'm talking about, there were two baseball players, pitchers. Yeah, I think they both played for the Yankees so, and the Indians. Is that right, yeah. Steve? So they're both at the time. They're both on the Yankees. I think. Yeah, and I think they both got traded, didn't they? After that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these, yeah, these baseball it. players, back in the 70s, when mm -hmm. it was the wild, wild west in baseball, the 70s, you had guys take, like Doc Ellis taking mm -hmm. ass and throwing no hitters and, and, yeah, uh, and no hitter. Yankees swapping wives. It was a very different baseball landscape. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and so this is what they were told to do. They didn't want to do it. Um, as they did. They fought it tooth and nail, actually. Took the longest, to their credit. Yeah, it took the longest time for Dee to convince his wife. She was uh, completely unglued when she heard it. And uh, when it came to the actual doing of it, um, apparently Kelly and Dee's wife consummated something which may have led to a child, too. That's, that's unclear. Oh, so Kelly, Ke Edward Kelly and Dee's wife hooked right. up. Oh, okay. Right. Dee slept, but did not have sex with with um, with Kelly's wife. In fact, Kelly Kelly apparently didn't even want to get married. It was right in the beginning when the angels kind of ordered him to get married, and uh, and so I'm sure you know. And, the, and this is all in you know Dee's household. You know Dee's got a bunch of kids. And, you know his wife is dealing with the household. And here's you know Kelly and his wife, and she doesn't want to be there. And nobody wants to be there. And you know, stricken. you know, and they're they're just trying to you know make ends meet and pay off you know pay off everything. So it must have been you know it must have been How quite a that conversation have gone. It's like right. You know, uh, you know, I need to talk to you. <laughs> we have a, we had a very interesting session with the angels yeah. today. And, uh, yeah. They said that uh, you need to uh, lay down with that word. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Lay down, I'm sorry. What do you lay down? As in husband and wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, she freaked. And she that, did freak. And, and consider, you know, consider how, and talk about, you know, Fritz Peterson and Mike Kekich and their wives, you know, and how big a deal it was then. Right? You can imagine how much a big a deal it was at the time for those people because it was against oh, I think it probably could have gotten locked up yeah and um, I, I really haven't figured out what was the point of it all yeah. did you get any inkling from no they just said it was a, it was a, it was a, a test. test like with like Abraham and I and his oh, son and Isaac his son. Okay. so that was I the think, I think I think Kelly I think Kelly made it all up and he just because he just wanted to sleep with John D's wife there you go but I, she would have been considerably older than him well maybe not because she was much younger she's the second she? wife oh, okay. jane and, and it was really apparently it was and apparently it was it was a real love match apparently there was a really good you know relationship that he had with his wife up until the very end you know um you know it's like i said everything with the angels is up for grabs as far as interpretation you know so what were they really doing um, and I just want to read this one thing, because at one point, the supposed fake angel comes in. They didn't know it at the time, but the, the later angels said it was fake. But this later angel um, gives them the message uh, 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 that 
One, there is no sin. Two, the soul goes from body to body, as in transmigration or reincarnation. Adam and Eve is not history, but an allegory. That there have always been the same number of humans on earth. And you shouldn't pray to Jesus or the Holy Spirit or play, pray straight to God. And, you know, so it's, it was just kind of interesting, you know, what, you know, because, you know, I would, you know, agree with, so I certainly agree with that there's the no sin part of it. But sin, of course, was, was huge in what they were doing. You know, the whole point of, of doing alchemy was to purify yourself. I mean, there's two aspects. There was the, there was the, the, the self-purification through the activity of alchemy. There's actually mm-hmm. three activities. This is the microcosm, macrocosm thing. So there's, so there's the purification of the self, purif- purifying your soul for, you know, and, and in this case, uh, it's for the second coming, which was, which was huge. And there's all these portents, and we can get into that. Um, then there was the social cleansing, which is the angels saying, well, let's get this prince to, you know, do this sort of thing um, and, and, try to, and try to, you know, cleanse the social climate and to make a world that is more appropriate for, for the second coming of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, what did I say? There's that, the social. And then there's the material. You know, when you're working with the materials themselves, there's always a purification element. That's part and parcel of the alchemical equipment, you know, purifying elements to get, get you know to get down to the pure gold and i think all of this like work that. was to bring about the new jerusalem to um revivify this sublunary world so ultimately their work was had a higher aim it wasn't for personal gain on any level it was really for the upliftment of right. all of humanity and what, and what happened every time they asked the angels for help for money yeah so the angels would say well you have to build this new table and they're broke so they're like, could we, please, sir, could we just have a few farthings, you know? And then the angels would be like, God, you humans, all you think about is money and materialistic things. No, go away. No, you're not getting it. <laughs> so they would just like banish them from the, from the session. So the angels had no, no concerns about material things. No, compad, just do it. Don't bother us. Get it us. done. Not Don't my problem. Us. Just do it. So it's mm-hmm. little- the whole thing is, is, is wild. Maybe we should just finish with the best story about the, about the, the angels in the books. You love that. Okay. Steve's just been really bugging to tell this one because it it is no, delicious. Well, you tell no, you go ahead. Right. Do better. You anyway. know it better. So, um, so they're in, at this point, they've kind of gotten to Prague and then they're back. And in, in, um, what happens is there's a, they befriend a priest and this priest, um, and he gets involved in the scrying and he was kind of a, let's say sort of a, you know, kind of a, a, a non-traditional friar. And he's interested in what they're doing. But what happens is that the angels take him under their wing and they say, um, yeah, but, you know, you really have to stay with the church and confess everything. So for him, that meant to confess what Dean and Kelly were doing to the local bishops and things like that. And so, of course, the bishops are saying, oh, really, you know, oh, we're really interested in what you guys are doing. Can, you know, can you do a demonstration for us? You know, and, um, oh, oh, no, even better. And so, 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 so Dean, Dean Kelly said, oh, he says, all right, we'll just come visit, you know, we'll have a chat. And they go, and Kelly just, just goes Spill off. the beans, right? And he just goes, you know, the church is the anti, you know, the Pope is the antichrist. The church is the most evil thing in existence. Probably just, right. You know, and, and he just goes off on him and he is like, Oh my God, you know? Okay. And so, and so, you know, they don't do anything at the time. And then they said, Oh, you know, the Pope wants to meet you in Rome <laughs> and see this crying thing. And they said, all right, well, we better, we, we're in trouble now. So the angels say, cause you know, D has got, you know, volumes, volumes eight, you know, uh, like 12 volumes of these, uh, of, of these, uh, like diaries, diary. of, these yeah. of these spiritual diaries of the scribe. And so they tell them, say, guys, you got, if you don't burn these books, they're going to, you know, they're going to take you and kill you once they see what you've written in these books. So, so they do that. They go to the fireplace, uh, in the place they're, they're staying in Germany at the time. Uh, and I forget exactly where, and they go to the fireplace they burn all the books. Month later, 
um, uh, one of them is looking out into the garden and they see this like funny looking gardener out there and he's uh, clipping some trees or something like that. And like, who is this guy? <laughs> I forget who it was, but I think it was Kelly sends his wife out to go <laughs> see who this guy is. So anyway, kind of disappears. They go out and look for him and he's sitting under a tree and all of a sudden one of the leaves from one of the books comes falling out of the sky. And this being goes and pulls like two of the books out that had been burned and hands into them. And, uh, and they're completely unsinged. And then this being goes into the, house. into the house, but he's not walking. He's like a foot off the ground. And they follow this, this guy into the, uh, I forget what he was wearing, some kind of robes or something like that. Follows him. And it's like, you know, the doors open in front of him, right. you know, like some, you know, it's like some B movie. And he goes uh, up to the fireplace where they had burned the books, reaches. There was a brick missing. There was a brick missing right behind And a light it. was shining through where the brick was missing. Yeah. He reaches his hand in and one by one pulls out the rest of the books. That they had saw, that they had seen themselves burn. Wow. So, so they got the books back. And so these are the, I forget, there was like about a dozen of them or something like that. And of course, to, to get to the end of the story, it's kind of like the Nag Hammadi, um, where uh, at the end of his life, he buried them in a box on the land, on his land, and his um, servant, after he died, went up and unearthed the box, brought it into the house, and of course, the, 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 the maid is lighting fires with the books. With the pages. Yeah. Yeah. So they, lost, they lost like a third of them, I think, something like that. They, they figure we're, 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 uh, ended up being burned anyway. So uh, it's, it's a great story. There's a weird lesson in there somewhere, right? You no. Know? Yeah. Hey, so I just found this really interesting image of right. the spine table. Very right. good. And right. so, this gives people some understanding about what they were working with here. Of course, we have the two inverted pyramids, which right. is the Magan, the Magan star. Right. And the glyphs or sigils. And, and, it's also the, and it's also reflective of, as we said before, the as above, so below. The right. two, two interpenetrating move, movements uh, going up to the spiritual and coming down into the material. And of course, we're in the middle. And where then the, the human is in the middle. Yeah, we're the, you know, we're the, we're, the, we're the place where all that happens all right. the time. Right. You know, so, um, yeah. So, you know, and so all these sigils come through and apparently the people who work with this, um, like Jason Louvre, who's, whose book on D we've, we've taken uh, Heavily, a lot on. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I have a complaint about the book in that he talks too much about Alistair Crowley for, for my, for my thing. Cause I, well, because you know, isn't Crowley like one of these kind of spiritual, well, students, right? I mean, well, Crowley actually thought he was the reincarnation of Kelly. Oh, of really? Kelly. Well, that makes that kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, you know, it does make sense. But yeah, you know, the, the the dark side of Kelly, I guess. But anyway, so this, but that's an example of taking. But apparently, this language works. But 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 what was Crowley doing it for? You know, and and then of course um, the guy you talked about in your show the other was it Parsons Jack. Jack Parsons, right. Jack Parsons. So they were kind of involved in this. Well, Parsons, Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard could theoretically be the modern D and Kelly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and again, and again, from my point of view, it, it's, it's an inversion of the spiritual, you know. Yes. So at, at a certain point in time during, during this period, um, that there was this idea that hermetic philosophy and sort of Judeo-Christian magic were kind of one and the same. They were not contradictory. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how has that worked out? Well, there were, because they were, because in Kelly's mind, he was a devout Christian. And he was doing this to get closer to understanding what, God and what God wants in this world, and also you have to look at the time in the in so, so in the 1570s. So let's say he meets he meets Kelly in uh, 1582. So a few years before that, there was a supernova, 
that was in the, 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 the sign of uh, Cassiopeia for 17 months. And apparently this supernova was so bright that it was seen during the day also. So there was these signs, there was, then there was a comet in 1577. And then um, there was the, uh, the, the, the what's called the great, um, the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in 1583, um, which supposedly was the same conjunction that happened at the time Christ was born. So for these people, these were all portents of the second coming. And they were trying to purify the world themselves to make the second coming more possible. In other words, you know, it wasn't just like Christ was going to, going to show up and, you know, sweep away, you know, all the, all the bad people. And then, and then everyone else was going to go to the fifth dimension. Um, you know, they had to do this work. So that was, so, so their, so their alchemy was always under the guise of, of, you know, of, of doing it to, to support this idea of the second coming of Christ. Um, and this whole support of Elizabeth, and he, he had the vision that Elizabeth should be the head of this, what they, they call it pan-Sophia, like all wisdom, and that somehow you could make an umbrella, sort of a Christian umbrella that would encompass all the world's religions. And for D, Elizabeth was supposed to be the head of that. Yeah, it wasn't there that illustration on the front of cover of one of his books where she's mm -hmm. at the helm of this ship. Right. And it's filled with symbolism. So, you know, you'd have to look at it. We'd have to put it up and maybe next time we could talk about it. But she's at the helm of this ship that's, that's being, bringing, ushering in this new world. And she was also into alchemy as well. She practiced. And yeah, she was into the optics and the, and the, I don't know about the scrying, but certainly the alchemy. And, D considered her to be absolutely a genius and she True. was very much involved in the work. She worked with him at some points in his laboratory. So yeah. she yeah. was very much interested. And she would show up at his house and yeah. he would explain his works to her and things like that. So they had, you know, a really good, they had a working relationship of some kind, Yeah, you know? Um, so one of the, so he writes a couple of books in the 1570s, a series of books. One of them is called The General and Rare Memorials. Another was called Limits of British Empire, and that's where the British Empire comes from. And uh, one, of, so one of the aspects of this book, of, of one of these books, is so he, he, uh, does, the, um, he does the justification. So it's weird. It's weird. You would think that you just, you know, these, these, uh, you know, these world kings and queens just go over and take something. But... They, they felt like they had to have this justification. They actually did. So for Elizabeth to rule North America, there had to be some precedent there. So, um, mm. one of the, so, um, so, so D in his youth was really good friends with Mercator, who was the, the, the famous map maker. Right. And he had all of the best maps and he actually invented the globe really. And D was the only person in England who actually had globes from Mercator. So, so, so he goes and uh, so he, he and Mercator gives him some information about um, Arthur establishing uh, legends of Arthur establishing uh, some some places uh, in, America. In, in America in like Greenland area, and then um, also there was um, uh, Saint Brennan, an Irish guy who supposedly established something, mm. and then um, this one in the eleven hundreds named uh, Marduk. So. So he, so G, G writes this whole book with his whole series of justifications of why Elizabeth should take over uh, North America. And then he also says, in order for the British to become an empire, you have to build an enormous navy, um, you know, to, to combat, you know, all these other forces, and especially the, the Spanish um, and the French at the time. So the weird thing is, of course, um, they they all tell tell D you know ah oh, forget it. we ain't gonna do this you know are you nuts, and then of course then a few years later when like he's not looking they do it, mm -hmm. so it's kind of weird so he never got credit for it really in his time, right um, the one that establishes all of it and and it's also and it's also in these books where he starts calling America Atlantis, 
and actually in these books, according to D, were, were dictated to him by the, the angel Michael. So, by the way, it was the angel Uriel that uh, told D and Kelly to swap wives. Oh, good. good. Yeah, yeah. So those and those are like you know big angels. You know, those are they're, they're, those are like main Uriel, Michael, Gabriel. Gabriel is is also you know the one who dictates the uh, the Quran to Muhammad, and also the one who who uh, the annunciation annunciation of Mary. You know, and uh, so He's so messenger. yeah. So these are the big angels and. Um, and each angel handles a certain epoch, you know. Oh, this is a really interesting painting, too, because they've actually done an x-ray on it. Mm -hmm. And around the, uh, the flame at the bottom, underneath this painting, there's a circle of skulls. Three, right? Is it three? I think it's or four or something, but I can't remember. But anyway, so, so actually underneath that painting, and no one knows exactly why, and it's not, a, it's not of the period. It's from the 1800s. Um, the painting is. Yeah, the painting yeah. is. Um, but yeah, there's actually there's actually a, a series of skulls under there. They've done you know the X-ray work on it, so that's kind of an interesting sort. From of that actual physical location. In this painting, behind underneath this painting is are no, painted skulls. Oh, I see. Yeah, oh, no, I see. underneath the painting itself, there are three skulls. Yeah, yeah. you know how they do the X-ray. Yeah, the sure. Old. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's that's a whole that's a whole you know other mis mysterious thing or you know and, and I don't I know nothing about the um you know the artist who painted it. So uh -huh. but so D is 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 you know basically giving Elizabeth you know justification to establish this new world, this new Atlantis, this new world order, and this what we said like Chris said before, this new Jerusalem. Um, and of course, New Jerusalem is again hooked up with the apocalypse of John, which was looming over everybody because they were all expecting the second coming. And the angels were constantly talking to Dee and Kelly about the second coming. And they kept on saying, one of the things they kept on saying, it'll happen in 88. And he always thought it was going to be 1588. And they never clarified. And then I think by the time 1588 passed, I think he was just, he had enough of it. So what's really interesting about this is that um, there's there are whispers of the second coming there are whispers of this kind of apocalyptic world and not just whispers but actual signs in the sky with the supernova and the comet mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. there's this rise of esotericism and if you look at like what was going on at the turn of the century with Blavatska and Rorick and Ledbetter and these characters, mm -hmm. they were also beginning in their minds to see the end of the world, right? I mean, they, they, were, they were in the process of creating a new world or a new age because the old one, in their mind, was ending, right? So, so to some extent, that was true because of what happened with World War I. I mean, their world or the worldview of the past, well, like 500 years, was ending. Mm -hmm. So that that part was true, uh, and then subsequently World War II. But what didn't happen was that they didn't have this this new order that emerged from whatever catastrophe they were foreseeing, which I think was probably pretty valid at that time. Yeah. Uh, but the same thing was occurring. It seems like with D and Elizabeth, and I think. Like if we fast forward, we can we can look at the immersion in esoterica and the occult that we're all swimming in right now. Mm -hmm. And because I was thinking about this when you were talking earlier about how um, you know could we find a common language? Could we find something that would you know kind of uplift us? Right? That there would be some kind of you know, spiritual wind, some pneuma that could like raise us up out of our sort of mundane, dualistic sort of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. turf war that we've been in for a while. And I thought to myself, well, what about the, the esoteric symbolism? And I'm not saying that this is really the case, but when, when you look around, I mean, we've never lived in a time, I think, where it's been more blatant and everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're all seeing eyes all over the place. You know, Trump's always doing this little thing. I mean, it's everywhere. So whether or not, 
you know, we can agree on the fact that these symbols portend and uplifting for kind of a new day. In fact, it was really interesting. I was watching uh, the NFL Network, and they've got this commercial, and they're talking about the new season, the upcoming season. And they actually use the phrase, it's the dawn of a new day. Hmm. Yeah, well, the NFL especially. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so there, so we're, I think now we're, we're completely immersed in a culture of a certain type of summoning. And I don't think that it's always very responsible, right? <laughs> like, like, it, it, like, it's like Goebbels, Goebbels meets John D in some way. Interesting you should say that, because I was listening today to a wonderful interview that Emily Moyers did with this guy, Jeffrey Gates. I know um, Jeff, yeah. What? I know Jeff. Do you? Yeah. And, and the, have you listened to this interview? So I have not listened to Emily and Jeff. Jeff's a real bright guy. Yeah, the conversation was about blockchain and mysticism. Right. And they're talking about this young man from Stanford Research Institute who is, I, I can't remember his name, but he's saying, I believe this kid is a mystic, that he is seeing things with this, they're, they're doing something with blockchain and then laying on top of the blockchain some kind of quantum entanglement. And as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, wow, this is reminding me, it's like an echo of the John D looking for the language of the angels like how do we how do we learn the, the voice of god how do we learn the language of god right well this, this check out the interview yeah, it's this, fascinating have you ever seen have you ever seen pie the movie pie yeah with, way couldn't, back couldn't way watch back it. yeah with darren aronofsky right it's a hard movie to watch the tiger no no that was no, no. no that was that's um, the life of pie 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 oh, oh, is okay. darren so, aronofsky's so first okay. movie Okay. And it's about it's about a guy who is he's he, he's this Jewish mystic, and he's and he's found the code, the number of God. Okay. And he's being hunted down by these rabbis who desperately want it, so that they can use it, gain control, and then you know summon the the the, the, the Mosiach, right, mm -hmm. the Messiah. He's being hunted down by Wall Street people who think that with this number they could control all the numbers and all the markets. And he's also being hunted down by aliens, right? Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so this is a this is this is an interesting story and, and thread that again, you know, it's got this it's got this loop and it's got this arc. Right. It's got legs. You find right. this thing that makes the 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 breath or the thought. Eminent. Well, well, D thought he found this with the, you know, if you want to bring it up, the Monus hi Hieroglyphica. Sure, let's, let's look at it. You know, so, yeah. that's, so that's the actual symbol that he thought would bring all this together. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, so, that's you know, a symbol so, of unity, actually. You know, and that was from a book he wrote in 1564. And the Monus hi Hieroglyphica, you can see on the left, so it's got the symbol, it's got a circle with a dot in the middle, which is a symbol of the sun. It's got the moon going up through it, and then there's the cross, and then the uh, the symbol of Aries, which is was it, is that like the first astrological sign or something like that? Right. Somehow it it it's supposed to encompass the whole of it, but if you take all those any of those elements and then you break them apart, like the cross into angles and things like that, you put together all of the astrological symbols can be made from that. And he saw that as condensing the entirety of nature into one symbol. Right. So that's why it was the monos. The monos, the monad is, is the unity. And so we so, have earth, air, fire, water, correct? Right. So you got yeah. the, the elements. The and elements. then, yeah. And, and so, and so, but every, so for him, and he had the, so there's a whole book that he dedicated to elucidating this symbol and its various meanings. And this is one of the books that he, he spent a lot of time tutoring Elizabeth on. Um, and so, and then the, and the proportions have to be, you know, absolutely exact and, you know, and I can't <clears throat> discourse on the proportions, but you can see this. So this is 
this is what he, what you were talking about. This is what he tried to do in his day to make a universal symbol. And the, uh, the later Rosicrucian texts put this symbol in the margins, um, even though no mention by this time, no one mentions D anymore. D is, is, has kind of become um, an anathema. He's, he's become someone that no one wants to deal with anymore because he gets um, associated with, by the time you get to the Puritans and James I after Elizabeth dies, D falls heavily out of favor and he, he, he's just considered, you know, this, this sorcerer that no one wants to deal with. So he gets forgotten by history. Yeah, I, I mean, both D and Kelly, their end games are not great. No. You, you know, I mean, maybe, was, I mean, was it worth it? Was that Promethean kind of, you know, stab at, stab at the fire? Right? Was it was it worth it for their? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But if well, I was, not in material if I, terms, right? Yeah. Not if in I was an aspiring terms. mystic and I was looking at their lives, I'm not sure that would be really all that interesting to me. Like the end game, you know? Yeah. yeah. And and again, we don't have anything about like the last 14, 15 years of his life where he was still doing scrying, still working with angels, and and none of that has survived. So we don't know you know, whether there was, you know, something fruitful that came along, there was nothing written, really. Right. So it's really, you know, so it's open-ended, you know. So, so, so talk a little bit about the link between D and Bacon, because it's going to be Bacon who's going to influence guys like Washington, Jefferson, right. Franklin. Right. Jefferson said Bacon was one of the, he had him listed as like the three greatest minds who ever li lived. Uh, I think John Locke was the other, and I can't remember who else he had listed. Um, but um, yeah, Bacon's a whole other big story. Um, Bacon, but he's associated with everything here, and he's kind of a half generation, you know, after after D. Um, but. Bacon is not on, Bacon, of course, is, is big, it comes to prominence in, uh, under, under King James I after Elizabeth dies. And so at that point, you couldn't really say you're hanging out with, with D. And I think in the end, it probably comes out to a couple of factions who are trying to do the same thing, the same sort of New World Order, same sort of New Atlantis. Right. Um, Bacon was less mathematical. Um, but he was also involved in, in, in empirical science, but he was not down with the as above, so below microcosm, uh, macrocosm. Right. But he was very much into empirical science. And then, you know, when we talk about um, his new Atlantis, he kind of delineates um, how that works as, as, he, as he depicts this, um, this society. And there were a number of people um, writing these kind of works, also these utopias at the time. They were... They were they were all, you know, very much interrelated, but this only comes out after Bacon's dead anyway. Um, Bacon does get involved in uh, his family; seems to be involved in the in the, uh, the Jamestown area and the formation there, and and um, Williamsburg. So there's oh, yeah. supposedly a cache. Williamsburg, Virginia. Williamsburg, Virginia. So they're supposedly buried somewhere. Uh, not it wasn't where the old church was, and and there's some tunnels under there, and in the tunnels there's supposedly a box with the cash that's going to prove that Bacon wrote Shakespeare and a bunch of stuff like that. Um, but um, in maybe our last show, we will in fact reveal who Shakespeare, <laughs> who wrote the Shakespeare plays. But we're going to keep that one. In our it's back about box. time that somebody did. You know, so, so, so Bacon kind of ignores D and then when Bacon founds, uh, was, was, was sort of the guiding light behind the founder of the Royal Society. Um, which was heavily influenced, and then and then that's when the Mason Masons start coming in uh, and, and working into that, and that's you know uh, the later 1600s. He's um, he's he's kind of behind that as a guiding light of of, of the Royal Society, um, but and and they they all completely ignore D. Mm -hmm. And someone like Francis Yates, who's considered by me and probably a lot of people the greatest scholars of, of Elizabethan England and Elizabethan traditions and, and the magic system and, and hermeticism. She wrote a brilliant book on Giordano Bruno. Um, you know, she, 
she she's the one who really brought these who, who researched and found these influence and all these things that everyone uh, is seeming to ignore and Bacon seems to get all the credit for it um, that's my take so far right you know, I'm not so, you know I'm that's not um, Bacon uh, according to um, there's a tradition um, that Bacon is actually uh, Saint Germain sure yep that, that uh, Bacon is, you know, an ascended master come to earth. Yeah. Um, but I haven't, you know, I, I guess I had just haven't, I haven't seen the reason why. Other than My first don't. spiritual teacher was absolutely, utterly convinced of that. Yeah. Yeah. He also said he was Count Rakazi. Right. He was one of these characters that showed up in the courts of uh, Europe for, mm decades and decades and decades and seemingly hmm. would not age. Oh, never heard that name before. Yeah, Count Rakazi. And apparently, I believe it was, he says, this is what he said, that Bacon showed up at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Right. And, and it was his voice which said, let freedom ring or something like that. Right, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a story of Manly Hall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah, that they're all like hesitating to sign. Right. And uh, and he, sh he then this 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 person shows up on, and they don't. Manly Hall doesn't say it's Bacon, but Manly Hall certainly you know thinks thinks you know the world begins and ends with Bacon. He doesn't. He just never says you know Bacon. It's always you know Lord Bacon. Or, well, know. everything goes better with Bacon. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Even I, ice exactly. Cream. Exactly. Yeah. Bacon. We, there's a place here that has bacon ice cream. It's incredible. By the way. And bacon, bacon and ice cream work. Bacon and um, bacon brown sugar ice cream right. is pretty ridiculous. Um, San Francisco, there was a place that was doing bacon coffee. Jeez. No. They were doing, yeah. Bake, bacon coffee. So, I forget what I was saying. But anyway, <laughs> you know. So, a little bit I'm, there. Sorry, Steve. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, so I'm, I'm not down with, 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 with bacon being, you know, the ascended master quite yet. Um, but maybe I can be convinced, you know, someone gives me a better reason. So uh, what the, uh, yeah, so the declaration, the problem is that, you know, they weren't in a room signing the Declaration of Independence together. It's right. the problem with the story. But mm -hmm. there are a couple of those stories, the story with the founding of the American... the spirit of the story? Right. So, yes, also with when there was a, um, they were uh, designing the American flag and they were having a, a committee... And they were just meeting in, uh, I don't know. Betsy Ross's house? Well, they were meeting, yeah. And they are meeting somewhere. And then um, they invited this professor. That they just, they all called him the professor, Washington and all these guys. And they didn't know it. He's not, doesn't have a name. And he's the one that supposedly gave them the, uh, you know, the details for what the flag should look like and the colors, et cetera. The mysterious professor. Right. But, but that's all right. You know, I, I don't mind yeah. having... You know this sort of um, th this sort of mythology behind things, and, and and bringing it in, saying you know there's something, you know there, there's something important about it, so important that that some so there has to be some some sort of divine intervention to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so I don't mind that 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 kind of you know mythology so much. Um, you know, so so there are a number of those stories. Like I said, a lot of those stories come out of um, Manly Hall, who's you know. Like I said, he's he was he's very he's foundational for you know being one of the first people to just you know go through all the world religions and put them all in the book, the secret teachings of all ages. It's a wonderful book, but you know you have to take his scholarship as being from the time and you know from the fact that you know he's you know he 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 never met a secret society that he didn't like. Right. And that was all these wonderful secret societies that are guiding us you know to this better place and right just the whole great white brotherhood thing yeah so you know and and so and and to get back to your original point yes it seems like there is a, a recapitulation with you know the time with blavatsky and the theosophy and then again of course theosophy leads into uh, anthroposophy with steiner mm -hmm. steiner talks a lot about atlantis and steiner, and and, and, uh, and yes and uh, and this and also Steiner talks about this revivification of Christianity, of, of a real um, Rosicrucian, Rosy Cross. I mean, you know, this elevation of, 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 the, of a real Christianity as opposed to, you know, 
the Papal system and all that. Right. So it's all, it's, you know, and it's over. And the other thing I thought of, which I think is really cool, is that, you know, Blavatsky and, and them, they're coming across at the very end of the Newtonian age and, and uh, D dies just as like the Newtonian and Newton, the Newtonian age begins. Right, yeah. Uh-huh. And of course, Newton was an alchemist, but he never published any of that stuff in his lifetime. Yeah. Right. He, yeah. So all that comes out of him is the mechanical universe, which goes into the enlightenment, which really goes into people like Jefferson and, and those guys, you know, where, the, where the, I think by the time you get to the actual founding fathers of this country, you have that um, separation of, of, of the divine is sort of out there, you know, he starts the engine, but, you know, we're the ones that keep the, keep the motor running. Whereas for D. Kelly D is these angels, you know, you were making an, you were making yourself through your life and through your work, you know, an actual imprint. This is what the alchemy was about. You were, you know, making this a better Christian place, a better place for the second coming for Christ to come and live in. And that seems to be their plan for the new Atlantis, i.e. America. Hmm. Well, I was, I was uh, just thinking as you were, you were talking about, Lavaska at the end of the Newtonian age. Again, this is all like pre-World War I. I guess you could also make a case that pre-World War II, it's about Crowley and Mm -hmm. Crowley's involvement um, in not just uh, his his version of symbolic magic, Thelema, the OTO, but like there are very clear root or like threads that, you know, Crowley was involved in stuff like Rudolf Hess and the parachuting of Rudolf Hess into England and the connection with the Nazis and trying to, trying to, you know, form some kind of occult armistice, right? You know, there was that whole story Hmm. that was, that was kind of going on at that time. Right. And then of course, Crowley as kind of an occult predecessor of world war two. Then we get out of world war two and I don't, I don't think there's like a, you know, the, the Korean War, although, of course, people lost lives, and I don't want to diminish that. But the next real big war is the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then just before the Vietnam War, we've got Tim Larry showing up. And this whole kind of, psych- you know, the beginning of the psychedelic explosion. Right. And this whole, like, next wave of esoterica and occultism where, where now the masses are being inundated. Right. And, and North America becomes almost like a mystery school there as mm. it comes over and all this other stuff really. Start. So there's this interesting kind of connection between this esoteric hermeticism and the end of a world and this potential for conflict on a grand scale. At least it feels that way. Now, I don't know if that happened after Kelly and D specifically passed away. But um, clearly, there were a number of wars that England had with Spain. During that yeah. Time. Well, there was actually. Well, we can. This is a whole other thread. But there, not long after that. So, so Kelly, when D died, sixteen oh eight. Yeah. Right. The first Rosicrucian manuscripts appear sixteen thirteen fourteen and sixteen or fourteen fifteen seventeen something like that. So very soon after that, the first man, Rosicrucian uh, manifestos show up. And then there's James I's daughter, Elizabeth, marries um, Frederick, the, um, the elector potentate, and he's a German prince. They, go, they get married, and it was this huge thing, and they go to Heidelberg, set up this fantastic place. I mean, water gardens, and, you know, just a, a place for, you know, alchemists and, uh, and hermeticists and, and, and just a really open place. Then they get invited uh, because of things going on in Prague to take, to take the throne in Bohemia. They do that expecting that, um, that and so the emperor, um, Rudolf, I can't remember, but the emperor behind, with, with the pope behind him, goes, uh, they, they went and, you know, they have this battle and they lose. 
but for they call it the, uh, the the something the winter the magic winter or something like that. So for a number of months they set up this this alchemical ki kingdom in Prague, which has a history of it, with between um, you know back when Dee and Kelly were there, there was Kabbalists, there was a, you know a big Jewish quadrant um, who were advising the emperor. So it was a really open place, even though of course you had a you know had to play things against the Catholic Church. Um, these Rosicrucian manifestos, I mean, they were literally said, you know, the Pope is the Antichrist. The, the, and that, you know, they were, they were dropping the gauntlet. They thought that it was, was going to happen. James I, so they have this battle. James I does not help his daughter. Everyone was expecting it. And James I loses incredible popularity in England because apparently his daughter was really popular. She was incredibly learned. She was kind of like her um, kind of like, you know, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth, you know, she, she was, she was well read. She read a lot of Bacon. In fact, I think Bacon, um, Bacon designed the theatrics for their wedding or something like mm -hmm. that. So, so he was involved in that too. So, um, so there was an attempt to do, to, to, to actually solidify in Europe, this alchemical kingdom. It got squashed pretty quickly. And right after that is what's called is the Thirty Years' War, mm -hmm. which apparently was was devastating to all of Europe. It was like one of the worst conflicts ever. I mean, just as far as every, everyone just everyone lost on that one. Mm -hmm. So, to so your point, that was the war after this attempt to establish the alchemical kingdom in Prague. Well, it seemed. I mean, I've never really given it much thought, but you you know, there seems to be a bit of a pattern here where there's this explosion of esoterica and understanding maybe perhaps that the world is going to change significantly, mm -hmm. whether it's through some sort of catastrophe or war or apocalyptic a second coming event or a second coming. And then this event happens, whatever the event, World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, um, I, it feels to me like we're, we're, we're kind of at that, that gate now. I mean, I, I don't see, here's the difference, right? I, I don't see like uh, the, the, the magician of our times. And the magician of our, maybe it's Donald Trump, I don't know. But the magician of our times yeah. is not out there conjuring, um, you, you know, the, 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 the forces. We're binding the spell, at least not outwardly, in front of us for this new reality. And the difference is, is that we live in a period where we are so immersed in esoterica and the occult that it's become a veritable commercial operation. Yeah, and it's all flipped. Yeah. It's flipped. That's the hard part. But I'm wondering if it's, are we the ones who have to bring in that vision? So does it have to then go into the population and it's the people themselves that bring the uplift. So, well, I think so, but I, but I, but I think that we get fra there's a, there's a fracturing of what that looks like mm -hmm. for for people, right? Like you, like the three of us could get together and maybe you know, fifty people listening to this or on the chat, and we could all get in a room together, and I think we could more or less agree on maybe eight out of ten things that we would want to have as part of our world or part of a new world, okay? That would be a small sample size. Mm -hmm. um, if I walked out of my place here and went down to the VFW, I think that that view would skew greatly. Mm -hmm. Firstly, if I got my car and I drove to Austin, you know, I might find somebody who might agree with three of those things, but the other seven aren't gonna work. Do we all have to connect up? Is it something that could be individual uplift? I think I here I, I think we can have something that's individual because I think it starts with the individual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's the group down. I think it's the individual up. But you know, there's that there's that kind of you know, right on the blockchain. It's the individual. It's the couple. It's right. the family, it's right. the community, right? And then it, you know, and then it has kind of a, a larger kind of umbrella effect. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but I don't think we live in a time where there's, there's a lot of agreement. 
I just, I, I just there don't. Isn't. And so to, to, and I'm trying to understand and wrap my head around, like when I look at this esoteric and occult immersion that we're in now, you know, the message that's coming through. <laughs> okay. I got, I got to bust the story. Up. Have you watched hard knocks at all? Mm-mm. Okay. So hard knocks is this uh, series on HBO and it's, it's following the Cleveland Browns during training camp. And there were these two guys on hard knocks. One of them is this guy named Devin Kajust and he play he's a backup tight end. And this guy's a piece of work. I love him. He's totally cool. He's got long hair. And it was last week. It was the Piscean full moon and they're playing in Philadelphia. Okay. Which is very esoteric. Hmm. Philadelphia is the esoteric like capital of the United yeah, States. We'll get into that at some point. Yeah. So he Don't walks, he, he, he walks over to, to Baker Mayfield and he says, look at the moon, man. Look at the moon. Can you feel it? You know, I can feel it. We could just draw it down. He looks and says, you're a leader of men. <laughs> get out there. Right? And I'm like, this is interesting. Now, conversely, earlier in the week, they were having this practice, and there are two guys who are really out there, like for the, for the Brown. That guy's out there. I like him. There's Miles Garrett, and then there's uh, Carl Nassib. And they're talking to this guy, Nate Orchard, who's, you know, he's a Christian. He's, you know, he's Christian, got a you know, wife, kids, whatever. And they're talking about aliens on the sidelines. Hmm. And this guy, Carl Nassib, is saying, oh, yeah, man, the aliens totally exist. I mean, you know, like, check it out, man. Like the Canadian, like the Canadian Minister of Government. All right. know, kind of like our Secretary of Defense. He basically said that the United States has been in contact with three separate alien races. It's true, dude. So here we have. Right, Ron so it's out there. Right? We, we, we've got, and, and by the way, Devin, Devon Kajus, he goes through this um, crystal shop, and he's naming all the rocks, and, you know, this is Sujalite. Oh, man, I can feel the swimming in my head right mm-hmm. now. This is a pro football player, right? Mm-hmm. Huh. So, so this is very interesting on some level because here's how the esoterica has really seeped in to like this, this kind of modern culture. And then you have this guy, Carl Nassib, who's talking about aliens. And it's, it's just a fascinating look into sort of the landscape. And these guys aren't like star players or anything, but you know, is that part of this new sort of like blending of kind of where we are like are we in the pro- because when i when i see on tv is a lot of rehashing of really old kind of babylonian mm-hmm. symbolism and magic right? right but during that conversation or during that show last night i saw something that was very unusual and it was like this creation to some extent of this kind of modern cosmology where there there is this like connection to earth magic and this pagan kind of thing with the moon right and there's this other guy who's into like this disclosure piece and somewhere in this mix is this new model that i i think that we're we're trying to weave and stitch together that's what that's what it feels like and i think what's been pushed out of the conversation is any kind of visionary idea for what the country can be with of a renaissance so you begin with language it, it starts with a uh, a stirring inside the individual and then you give voice to it so it, language is a carrier wave so we talk about it and we talk about well what was the vision for america can is that still alive can we tap into it can we can we nurture it as individuals and can we have a renaissance? Let's have a I, well, renaissance. Yeah, I, th- I don't think, okay, I think the juice, the visionary juice is there for globalism. Right? It, has not, it doesn't have, I don't think, like when I think of America now, and that's not to denigrate any of the, you know, the people that are wanting to make America great again, th- that feels like kind of a rehashing of something that's already occurred. 
right? That's what it feels like. Yeah, and I don't think nationalism is the answer, but I think culture is the answer. I think it's more, you don't want to say nations, you want to say countries. Right. So, right? So yeah, I mean, there's I a very big difference. That. So nations yeah. are political, countries are cultural. Right. And they have their own particular taste. Right. You know, in Sanskrit, you would say rasa, a taste, this flavor of who we are. And then you uplift and you feed the beautiful. Like, you know, instead of just having a little crappy little composition notebook, you know, well, you make it beautiful. You know, so you put beautiful things on it. You take right. some things, you make it beautiful. You right. take the mundane and you elevate it. And the more you do that, and that becomes a way of life, then that radiates out. And it has an effect. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to contrive it. You have to live it. And by you living the beauty and being the beauty, like the Native American people would say, the beauty way. Mm -hmm. We live in the beauty way. Walking beauty. And that's living in harmony with the elements of life. And people respond to that. They don't respond to ugly. You know, I, I, would, I would tend to agree. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting time because the longer that the, this charade goes on between Mueller and, and, and um, Trump and the whole backstory, the longer this goes on, the, the more we are becoming fatigued. Oh, absolutely. By the whole experience. And that's, by the way, by design. That's totally by design. Of course it is. Yeah. You exhaust your opponents. Yeah. And so f even to keep up with it or to kind of re-rack your brain so you're always kind of you know, reformulating, you know, the, 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 the social theater so you're not oppressed by it, whatever that is, it takes energy. It takes mm -hmm. energy and it takes some intention but, and will. But you know what? Beautiful feeds you. I agree ugly, with you. Ugly drains you. So I, I, you know, I agree develop with you. language that's beautiful. Mm -hmm make your surroundings beautiful and refuse to participate in ugly and reject it and as we know ugly is a cia oper operative <laughs> ugly is a cia op actually you know have you seen the, have you seen the new cosmopolitan no. the new cosmo yeah. magazine no. I, w I wouldn't say it's ugly it's it's a, a a like triple plus model who's covered in tattoos oh uh, it was really interesting because I was reading comments on this, uh, on this cover. And one of the things that came out of it was like, yeah, okay, fine. You know, this is your vision of beauty, but you know, you're probably stage two diabetes or diabetic at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So they're looking at it from a health perspective, yeah, right. which I thought, well, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in a really, a really interesting time. Yeah. And I think we're, we're in the, throws of a major deconstruction phase which we've talked yes. about yes and uh whatever comes out of this period that we're in is going to be well it'll be interesting and that's and i i think that that's really kind of a probably an overused word because i i don't really have the language to articulate kind of where this is headed and what it might look like mm -hmm. and there may be a period of time where it may not look very pretty just to be honest with you yeah well ain't exactly pretty now but yeah the, you know and i think the operative word for at least for for forming a basis because every time you know because everything everything is, everything is based on you know uh, false premises and, and lies and things like that so you know we're we're, we're stuck you know, and until, you know, and just, you know, even with our friends who are trying to half wake, things like that, all we really ever hear is, I just want to know the truth. I just want to know the truth, you know, and, and, and that's maybe one form of start. And, you know, of course, truth, you know, at this point, we don't need truth with a capital T, but maybe we just need a fact with a capital F, you know? Yeah. Um, just, just so that we are basing our conversations on, uh, on something real as opposed to every, you know, every conversation is based on false 9-11, all the false yeah. flags, all the false shit that's been thrown, shoved down our throats time and time again. Um, and and it, that's, that's the really the thing to overcome that is, that is just so hard. The net is cast wide and complete 
but it doesn't cover our hearts. It doesn't cover our souls. And that's our, you know, and that's always our only way out of it, you know? Uh, well, I think it's a great, that's a great place to end our wonderful discussion today, which lasted two hours. Did it really? Oh, geez. Yeah, we <laughs> thanks, really everybody. Out. thanks for hanging out, everybody. Yeah, out out. Wow. Yeah, that was a good one. So why don't we uh, try to, next time we get together, let's put a bow on this and uh, let's move on to United States and bacon and yeah. try to get everybody up to, up to speed here because the, the D stuff has been real fascinating. Yeah. I'd like to, yeah, I'll start off next time with the, or people can look at, there's a tower in Newport called the D tower that was designed, likely designed by him. It's a mysterious tower has all these incredible um, astronomical alignments and um, it was an attempt to physically um, put a, a, some sort of uh, alchemical template into this, uh, into this, into the actual landscape here in 1583. So I think it's a good place to start to where, you know, just bring it all together, what he actually did you know, or had done. And if you go onto YouTube, Jim Egan has a lot of videos of the tremendous work that he's done. Mm -hmm. This is one of his books. He's got a bunch of them, but this is um, one of the books on the work that he's done. Oh, I've seen that book before. Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. It's got a lot of nice illustrations, and he really goes to pains to explain. But he's done all the research. What he think. He's, he's got these really cute, like, reenactment videos that he does and little plays and make, to make it relevant, to make it come yeah. alive. Well, speaking of books, you got any books from your uh, publishing company you want to throw in front of the camera? Um, not within reach, but, you know, um, I'm going to put up, I, I did do a uh, timeline for all of this and maybe I'll put up some notes. Uh, there's uh, and, and uh, under this video, I'll, I'll just put up a, a link to it, to our website. We have lots of books. I strongly encourage anyone who loves to read. We have different kinds of books. We have, we have, you know, fantasy, incredible fantasy novels. We have, um, and we have this complete set of works. If you're into history, of um, Fitzhugh Ludlow um, about his trips across the continent in, in 1863 and his, um, his mystical visionary book about taking hashish in 1856 called The, uh, the Hashish Eater. Um, that's our recent, our recent books they're, and they're hardcover. They're beautiful books, they beautiful. incredibly well uh, illustrated and well made and um and uh, not as uh not as cheap as our as our paperback books and where and where can they find these wonderful books so that is at logosophiabooks.com l o g o s o p h i a b o o k s dot com i'll put a link um in the, in the comment section under this so that people I'll can make sure it gets in there so people can and there's a, and like I said there'll be and uh, and then I put up I just started a page on the site where um, there's a there's, there's a really useful timeline I like timelines of, of all these characters we've been talking about what you know when they lived when books were published and things like that yeah cool. so that's really helpful if someone wants to print that out as we're going along through these programs right or, or even go off on their own research. Yeah, please, exactly. Yeah. Please and yeah. sing, sing along with Mitch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks guys. And, um, I'll see you. We'll see you in a month. All right, Great. Robert. Thanks. All right. Bye. -bye.